Attorney General Jeff Sessions has launched a so-called religious liberty task force at the Justice Department. Sessions says freedom of religion is under attack. He cited an example of nuns being ordered to buy contraceptives, and he praised the baker who recently won a Supreme Court case after refusing to make a wedding cake for a same-sex couple. Well, there's a gay cake in your neighborhood. Who you gonna call? Religious Liberty Task Force. On the top of that cake, they're both dudes. Who you gonna call? Religious Liberty Task Force. I ain't afraid of no gays. If a guy seems odd and he's got the wrong God, who you gonna call? Religious Liberty Task Force. They speak Espanol or use birth control. Who you gonna call? Religious Liberty Task Force. I ain't afraid of no gays. When you wanna throw the first stone, pick up the phone and call Religious Liberty Task Force. Welcome to this week's episode of FFRF's Ask an Atheist. That was a late show with Stephen Colbert's take on our topic today, the new Religious Liberty Task Force, announced by Attorney General Jeff Sessions. I am your host. I'm a constitutional attorney here at FFRF. My name is Liz Cavell. I'm Ryan Jane, also an attorney at FFRF. And I'm Andrew Seidel, an attorney and FFRF's Director of Strategic Response. If a guy seems odd and he's got the wrong God, pretty much sums up this new task force. It's not really about religious liberty. It's about preserving and defending religious privilege, specifically Christian privilege. And Jeff Sessions made that pretty clear when he was announcing the RLTF. A dangerous movement, undetected by many, but real, uh, is now challenging and eroding a great tradition of religious freedom. There can be no doubt, it's no little matter, uh, it must be confronted intellectually and politically uh, and defeated. Uh, yeah, so that's Jeff Sessions announcing the task force and talking about this threat that makes the task force uh, necessary. And my favorite part of that <laughs> opening is um, when he says that the threat is undetected by many, which is a <laughs> euphemism for <laughs> all <laughs> in the head of persecuted Christians. Um, so, yeah, I, I think... Um, we're all still kind of left trying to figure out what the Religious Liberty Task Force is um, and what the, um, what the DOJ is doing and why, but uh, Sessions himself in that speech men mentions three examples um, of why, illustrating why we supposedly need this task force and um, presumably the kinds of issues that the task force is going to be addressing. So take a look at this. But in recent years, the cultural climate uh, in this country and in the West more generally has become less hospitable to people of faith. Many Americans have felt that their freedom to practice their faith has been under attack. And it's easy to see why. We've seen nuns ordered to buy contraceptives. We've seen United States senators ask judicial and executive branch nominees about their do about dogma even though the Constitution explicitly provid, pro, prohibits a religious test for public office. We've all seen the ordeal faced so bravely by Jack Phillips. Unbelievable. Well yeah. put by our Attorney General. Um, okay, so a few things um, being raised there. Guys, nuns being ordered to buy birth control. Yeah. yeah, so that didn't, I mean, all of the things he mentioned there were lies, and that one is a particularly bad one. Yeah, I mean... What's a, he talking about? So on a couple of different fronts. First of all, the it, it, he makes it sound as if there was gun to the head, none, you must go and purchase this birth control, and that <laughs> definitely did not happen. Uh, the Affordable Care Act required religious organizations to uh, reimburse for the cost of uh, contraceptives within healthcare plans, so it's not being forced to buy contraceptives, first of all, and even if it were, there was an opt-out procedure that was incredibly simple. It was just five blanks on a form 
And so the legal battle that he's referring to was over the question of, is it a substantial burden on religious liberty to have to fill out these five blanks? And this is a picture of the form on yeah, the screen. I mean, it's kind of amazing. It's name, it's the name of your organization, the person filling it out, address, sign, date. That, that's all they're actually requiring. And that is a burden on religious liberty according to Judge Kavanaugh, who is now nominated for the Supreme Court, and Jeff Sessions. And that is what he is saying was the nuns being forced to buy birth control, filling out a five blank form to opt out of the Obamacare contraception right. So mandate. the nuns he's referring to being the uh, Little Sisters for the Poor, which is um, a religious organization, but more to the point of this battle, um, an employer of people. Mm -hmm. Um, providing a uh, group health insurance plan. So under the ACA, uh, employers providing group health insurance plans, those plans are required to cover contraception. Of course, religious organizations are able to opt out of that coverage so that their plan is not paying for the birth control and filling out that form that we just saw um, is the way to opt out. And doing that is this um, violation of religious liberty that the, the task force is on the case of. Yeah, so I mean, it's kind of amazing. It's literally just fill out this tiny little bit of information about yourself, and that jeopardizes their religious liberty. That's the issue. It's been going bouncing up and down the courts, the federal court system for four years now, I think. Uh, and now we have a task force that's established and assigned to help fix this problem of filling out a five blank form. The only way to make it sound remotely reasonable is to do what they've done, to twist it, not just as to try to say this is a burden on religious liberty, but then to say they're being forced to do a particular thing. And, and it do doesn't sound very compelling if you're saying they're being forced to fill out a form. No one's going to be swayed <laughs> by that. So they have to say they're being forced to buy contraceptives, which is just completely false. Okay, so the nuns being forced to buy birth control. Um, we heard about um, a religious test for public office yeah. and uh, um, about Senator Feinstein, and um, I didn't, I can't remember his exact words. Yeah, so this, what he's referring to there is when Senator Feinstein, Diane Feinstein, was questioning Amy Coney Barrett, who was Trump nominated for the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals to be a judge there. And she, uh, Diane Feinstein, was questioning Barrett about a law review article Barrett had written when she, in which she essentially said that when your duty as a judge conflicts with your Catholic faith, your faith has to triumph. So if you have a judge saying that, or somebody who wants to be a judge saying that faith and dogma trump the oath you've sworn to uphold to the Constitution, that's a perfectly legitimate line of questioning to be asking them about. In fact, it would be a dereliction of the senator's duty to not ask somebody if they were going to be able to uphold the oath they swore to protect the Constitution. And so Diane Feinstein was asking uh, Barrett about this, and she used some language that I actually really enjoyed. She said, it sounds like the dogma lives loudly within you. Um, and that became a sort of rallying cry for religious liberty. But it's not a religious test for public office at all. There's the, she's not saying, because you're Catholic, you don't get to be a judge. What Senator Feinstein was saying is, because you wrote that your Catholicism trumps the ability of you to be a judge, uh, fair-minded, you, this is something we need to ask you about. Uh, not saying you're absolutely barred, it's not a bar to office at all. And in fact, most of the Supreme Court is Catholic, so it's obviously not a religious right. test for public. And of course, as we know, uh, Amy Coney Barry Barrett went on to be confirmed and um, appointed to the Seventh Circuit, where she now sits, and so um, I'm not sure what the Religious Liberty Task Force is gonna unearth there in terms of uh, public or a religious test for public office. Yeah. But. And of course she was also one of the top contenders behind Brett Kavanaugh to be uh, nominated to be on the yes. nation's top court. So right. She was on Trump's short list for yep. the Supreme right. Court. Yep. So I guess her Catholicism is not preventing her from um, elevation in the federal judiciary, but we'll see. And then um, the third example that he talked about in that clip. Was Jack Phillips. Oh, Masterpiece Cake Shop. So. Um, He's talking about Jack Phillips, who I think was a guest of honor at that uh, um, at that press conference uh, or whatever that was, Religious Freedom Summit, where uh, Attorney General Sessions was announcing the task force. So Jack Phillips, uh, who's Jack Phillips, and uh, what are we talking about in terms of this is an example of religious persecution in America? Yeah, I mean this is this is kind of ridiculous. Jack Phillips is the guy who owns the Masterpiece Cake Shop Bakery, and that is the bakery that 
discriminated against a gay couple refusing to make them a cake because, as Phillips once said, um, I don't. Jesus was a carpenter, and I don't think he would have made a bed for a gay couple. So I'm not going to make a cake for a gay couple. Uh, that was a quote he gave to the Washington Post once. So he refused this couple a cake because of their sexual orientation, which is illegal under Colorado law. That case went up to the Supreme Court. Uh, Phillips argued that he had a free speech right not to make the cake and a free exercise of religion right not to make the cake. In other words, to discriminate in the name of his God. The idea is my religion grants me this license to discriminate against other people. I get to opt out of the civil rights laws because my God says so. Um, no court has ever held that. The Supreme Court's rejected that argument actually several times in the past. It's not really contentious or controversial to say that you have to obey civil rights laws even if your God says something different. Um, but we're seeing this attempt to redefine and weaponize religious freedom and it kind of culminated in the Phillips case. The Supreme Court didn't do what Sessions and presumably this task force wanted, but they did uh, give a win of sorts to the baker. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, it, as you said, the, this is not a new set of arguments to mm -hmm. say that this law shouldn't apply to me because it conflicts with my religious beliefs and I should have a free exercise ability to act on those beliefs even if it violates the law. The law shouldn't apply to me. But the difference is that the, the Supreme Court has never bought that argument at all. It's essentially gotten laughed out of court consistently. Even if, if you look back at the Smith case in 1990, even Antonin Scalia was on the right side of of that issue when they try to Correct say the, the, the yes <laughs> right it's what I was trying to say that uh, that drug laws shouldn't apply to users of peyote because they used it in a religious uh, for religious reasons and the court said no if we if there is a neutrally applicable uh, a neutral generally applicable law that applies to everybody you don't get to just opt out because it conflicts with your religion but there is this massive push now to redefine that and say no if you are acting in accordance with your sincerely held beliefs, you ought to be exempted from from laws. And it's uh, and I think there are at least some uh, some whispers in the the court that they uh, they might be buying that. If you look at cases like Trinity Lutheran, where they're t they're looking at the idea of uh, giving churches equal access to federal funds. Right. I mean, that's a crazy idea too. And I think just 20 years ago, they would have said, no, this is totally unprecedented. But now they're they're taking a new look at it. And it's, it's very, very concerning. Right. So the Masterpiece uh, Cake Shop case, sort of, uh, or the decision by the Supreme Court in that case, like you mentioned, Andrew, it sort of gave voice to this whole ethos behind the Religious Liberty Task mm -hmm. Force that there's, ho there's hostility towards um, conservative Christian religious beliefs in this country and you know that's really a problem and a threat and something that really needs to be guarded against and that was sort of the grounds on which the the Baker um, sort of won in that case the court didn't say anything sweeping about whether or not religious believers have a right um, to violate the law just as a general matter but he did say that Jack Phillips himself in the masterpiece case um, had his free exercise rights violated because hostility was shown to his beliefs in the process. In other words, um, decision makers who were reviewing this case along the way um, were critical of his desire to discriminate against people based on sexual orientation. Although it's really, it, it's, it's such a bizarre ruling because what was actually happening there is that uh, the person who made these comments was basically saying, using religion as a justification for discrimination is despicable, mm -hmm. which how can anybody not agree with that statement? That's a very fair thing to say. And if anything, he was standing up for religion as saying you shouldn't be tarnishing religion in this way. And the Supreme Court said that was evidence that he hadn't been given a fair trial, essentially. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, and it, it is pretty ridiculous, when, especially when you look at what the that person on the Colorado Civil Rights Commission actually said, you know, what she said was very, very mild. Um, also very true. Yeah. And I, the idea that, and it actually, at the point in the process, you know, they had already made their decision, they'd already written their opinion, it was on a motion to stay, basically saying, let's not, we're not gonna, this isn't gonna have any effect until the appeal's done. So it didn't actually infect or taint the process in any way. It was already right. all done, but the Supreme Court said that 
that language in it right there is enough that you violated his rights, so he gets a get out of jail free card this time. So it's pretty alarming. We we can we know the direction they're going to be going with this task force, but we don't know a whole lot else. Right, right. So um, that kind of is a good transition into um, what we do know about the Religious yeah. Liberty Task Force. So Jeff Sessions announced this task force, you know, with great fanfare in the clip we saw. Um, he, you know, gave his examples of where we're seeing this. Um, undetected by many <laughs> threat and uh, he talked about how he's creating um, a task force to sort of uh, look into these matters so what is the what do we know about the religious liberty task force who's kind of behind it or who's going to be on it or what's its directive I mean do we know anything about um, what to expect yeah we don't we don't know much at this point um, it's been a week already and the fact that we don't know much is kind of alarming. It may also be a good sign. Um, there have been a number of open record FOIA requests submitted to find out more. Basically, we know the name of two people who are going to be uh, at least kind of running the task force nominally, and that's it. Uh, we also are pretty confident that ADF, the Alliance Defending Freedom, which represented Masterpiece Cake Shop, uh, <clears throat> Jack Phillips, is heavily involved in this task force. Um, we know that Sessions did a listening session with them. We know that he's speaking tonight to their uh, their actual, they're having a religious liberty summit tonight. You can see right here on the screen at 7.30, Sessions go is going to be speaking to ADF. Um, this group is, they're the anti-FFRF. Um, they're a lot bigger. They pull in about $50 million a year and they take cases that uh, FFRF is consistently opposing. They're, uh, a, they're dedicated to preserving Christian privilege, and so that's why we're pretty confident, especially given what Sessions was saying, that that is what the Religious Liberty Task Force is going to be doing as well. But in terms of details, we don't know a whole lot right now. Yeah, so the, the best case scenario, I think, would be that this is basically a publicity stunt and it's pandering to the um, you know, Christian nationalist kind of base of the uh, uh, the voting uh, electorate, but I think much more likely, and certainly what ADF is pushing for, is that this is going to be an, a very active intertwined, intertwined group into all sorts of different facets of American life. And one thing that they specifically said was that this that they would be doing litigation, that they would be in court defending the religious liberty rights of Americans, which is really twisted if you think about it. The Department of Justice is supposed to be upholding laws. If they're in court, they're supposed to be there to defend laws. And if it's, it's on the defendants and the defense, defendant's attorney to make these kind of loony arguments that, no, this law doesn't apply to me because of my religious beliefs. And now there, this seems to be saying, that, no, the DOJ is going to flip sides and say, court, you should listen to that argument. Since this person has this religious belief, please don't enforce this law against them. So that's, that, that's yeah, scary. I think that's, the, that's the scary version, is you right. have essentially ADF, this Christian privilege law firm, this religious right group, capturing the Department of Justice and then doing what they normally do, but doing it with the stamp of the federal government, we the people, the Department of Justice, which so, is bad right. to an so, extreme degree. So we suspect the Alliance Defending Freedom has been heavily involved in sort of the creation of this task force, or at least the inspiration behind it. Um, uh, they've been sort of featured at these events with uh, Attorney General Sessions. We saw that uh, he's speaking at one of their events tonight. Uh, there seems to be a close relationship there. So what is the involvement? I mean, you kind of alluded to it, Andrew, but what do we know about ADF? What are their goals? What does that tell us about the task force's goals? Um, you said they're a religious right uh, legal organization, kind of like the anti-FFRF. Who are they? What do they do? Um, so the what does that tell us? Yeah, so the Alliance Defended F Defending Freedom was started in the early 90s. Um, they grew. They were started by a number of different leaders on the religious right and within the evangelical Christian community. Uh, and it grew pretty quickly. They do a lot of legal work here, but also a lot of legal work abroad. Um, they do a lot of lobbying and pushing for anti-gay legislation uh, in Africa, in Russia, things like that. They are labeled a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, and there's 
good evidence on the SPLC website to suggest that they are in fact a hate group. Um, you know, there was we had a little bit of a tiff with SPLC over uh, Ion Hersey Ali, uh, but they're they're right when it comes to ADF, I think, and. Their, their goal really is now to redefine the nature of religious freedom. They've been losing uh, in court, the religious right has, for a long time when it comes to state church separation. So they're taking this new tack and trying to say that we have not only a right to believe, which has always been absolute and nobody's contested that, but we have a right to act on those beliefs, absolutely. And that has never been the case. And so they're trying to say, no matter what happens, as long as we, as long as our action is motivated by religion, we are able to act on that and the government can't stop us. And that has been struck down by the Supreme Court in numerous times, starting in 1878. I mean, that's a recipe for anarchy. Uh, and you know, the example that Thomas Jefferson used, the example the Supreme Court used was child sacrifice. You know, if you believe that God is telling you to kill your child, you don't have a right to act on that. Yeah. And ADF, as you mentioned, is incredibly well funded, and they're also obviously very well connected politically. Not only are they hosting just sessions to talk about this thing, but they help to uh, design the Religious Liberty Task Force and the Religious Liberty Memo that went, came before that. Um, they th almost certainly had an influence on Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State's religious uh, liberty efforts uh, that were also uh, released Last recently. Weekend, yeah. And then uh, they, along ADF, along with the Federalist Society, are also helping Trump to pick Supreme Court nominees. Right. So, I mean, make no mistake that we are fighting an uphill battle and we are outgunned here both uh, in terms of uh, funding and in terms of they are holding influence. some very powerful strings. Yeah. yeah, when it comes to funding and influence, we are definitely outgunned. Yeah, well, there seems to be, um, you know, the, the really obvious flavor in the uh, Stephen Colbert uh, piece, which is hilarious. Um, it seems to be like there's no secret um, you know, that's a, a thing in prime time or, you know, <laughs> late night uh, mainstream network TV, just really out there with the idea that like, this is about anti-LGBT, um, you know, activism, I guess, for lack of a better word. And I mean, the, the video is kind of making light of it, but how much, how much like, do you think anti-LGBT um, motivation is behind uh, Jeff Sessions, the Trump administration? We know ADF is motivated a lot by anti-LGBT uh, activism. Um, why are we seeing that embraced by the public and kind of you know unmasking this idea of religious liberty? Because uh, the Religious Liberty Task Force obviously seems like something that is innocent and benign and and American sure. um, protecting religious liberty. Uh, why is nobody buying that? Why is Stephen Colbert, you know, with the gay flag and the you yeah. know, X out yeah. on the side of the Ghostbusters car? Like, well, what's I, giving that impression? I think we're finally maybe turning a little bit of a corner here. Um, the you know the attempt to redefine religious freedom to weaponize religious freedom. Is, has been going on for quite a while, um, at least probably since the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which was passed in the mid 90s. Uh, that's been, the religious right has been attempting to warp that and use it to their own ends, including anti gay ends. Um, that drive ramped up, it went into overdrive after marriage equality took effect when the Obergefell decision came down. And then we really started to see the other side get desperate to figure out a way that they could kind of preserve their privilege. And they pu they pushed as hard as they could. And I think what we're seeing now is people are realizing that this religious liberty argument is nonsense, that it really is just a mask to discriminate and that it's all about trying to use the machinery of the state to impose your religion or to give yourself a license to discriminate. And I think, you know, we saw that with the Colbert skit. They had another skit where Rob Corddry came on and was an agent of the Religious Liberty Task Force. The Daily Show did a skit with uh, Robo Christ on it, uh, who's <laughs> buff with the Religious Liberty Task Force. Uh, there was a great cartoon uh, uh, from one of the Buffalo papers by Adam Zyglis, uh 
showing yeah showing sessions for what this truly is this is about protecting the faithful and it's about you know protecting religion not necessarily all religions but specifically christianity um, so I, th right. I think we're finally seeing the mask or the veil, the curtain kind of lifting and people are realizing, oh, this is going on. And it's nice for us because we've been ringing this alarm bell for five or six years since basically before the Hobby Lobby decision, we saw this fight coming uh, and have been sort of shouting into the void. And now people are finally starting to listen. Yeah. And right. I, I mean, decades ago, it was really the same battle, the same arguments that were being made, except that it was about race at the time and about the right to discriminate against uh, against non-whites rather than against yeah. uh, same-sex couples. And now that's politically unpalatable. There's no way that you could say that and not have everybody turn against you because we have grown as a society where now we, we've said uh, there's at least enough of majority saying this is totally unacceptable that you can't make those arguments. And I think we're moving in that direction for LGBTQ rights, but we're, we're not there yet. And so they feel this is a battlefield they can still fight on. But I think that's also something to think about for anyone who's on the fence about this like masterpiece type situation where it's like, you know, I've heard people who are otherwise reasonable saying, well, maybe we should be allowed to decide which wedding cakes you, you make for. But I mean, it's it, you could make the exact same argument to say inst instead of saying I would serve a gay couple, but I'm not going to participate in a gay wedding. It's the exact same argument as saying I would serve a black couple, but I'm not going to participate in a black wedding. I mean, that I think everybody would recognize that as just out and out racist. And and, it's the same thing. And I think that's that's a great point. And it, because once you open the door and once you grant this license to discriminate, there is no turning back, and there's no way to differentiate yeah. legally speaking between race and LGBTQ status. And if you actually go listen to the oral argument in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, uh, when ADF's attorney was up there arguing this case, the, that was one thing that the court kept hitting on. And I think it's one reason they were reluctant to actually give the sweeping decision that ADF wanted. They said, how, do, how can we possibly draw the line if we allow this when it comes to race? And nobody had a good answer for it. It's very clear that there's no way to draw the line. And I don't want to say necessarily that that's an end goal for ADF, but it's certainly something that's going to happen if mm -hmm. they are successful. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I am looking um, at some questions that are coming in on our Facebook page. And if you have a question about this topic, you can um, just uh, plug it into the comments there on Facebook and send it our way. Um, here's one from Keith Hayward. Hayward. Is there any chance that the task force would help protect religious minorities such as Muslims? Um, ha 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 ha. <laughs> I wouldn't count um, it. But. Uh, <clears throat> so I will say in the longer version of uh, the AG's remarks there announcing the task force, of course, he certainly paid some lip service to um, protecting religious minorities and, um, you know, kind of feeding examples of, of discrimination against actual persecuted minorities um, into the rationale for this task force. I can't remember exactly what he talked about. Do you guys? I don't remember exactly what he talked about, but he, he certainly did pay lip service to protecting minorities. I mean, but the, the, the real point here is that there is not a threat to religious freedom in this country. There is a threat from religious freedom, and it's because they are deliberately trying to weaponize and redefine it. Um, I would not expect this task force to do much for minority religions other than one or two maybe Token high, work. high, yeah, high mm -hmm. profile things that they can point to to say, yeah, this, see, we really are doing the right thing here. Yeah. You're all wrong. And it's incredibly telling, I think, that every example he gives has to do with using religion as a sword to discriminate. Mm -hmm. He's not talking about examples where, you know, there's anti-Muslim discrimination happening. It, he could have said that and he and he didn't. He's, he is not interested in protecting religious minorities being targeted in a discriminatory fashion, he's interested in protecting people who want to use their religion to discriminate. Yeah, I mean, anti-Semitism has skyrocketed since Trump took office. There have been, there are plenty of examples he could have pointed to. I just to. remembered one of the examples was actually, um, that he used was, it was maybe an Orthodox Jewish uh, congregation who wanted to build a synagogue. Um, oh yeah, with and, the, the and zoning laws. How they, yeah, how I don't know, Jeff Sessions himself or the DOJ or I don't know, yeah. uh, stepping in to yeah. help. Uh, Never mind that there's already a law in place, RL UIPA, that deals with that and was, I'm sure, what solved that problem. Right. But yes, I would not expect much 
in the way of uh, minority and, religion work and here. And even less so for secular Americans. Yeah. Right, right. Sure. Yeah, Jeff Sessions did not mention discrimination against uh, atheist, agnostics, or non-religious yeah. Americans. Uh, I wouldn't expect um, much <laughs> no. force from the task force on that. Um, this is actually a really interesting question. Jamie Miller says, could this task force help overturn Roe versus Wade? Mm, that's, that is interesting. I, I mean, I, we know that's something that Sessions certainly wants. Um, right. And there, there are, uh, that is one of the sort of attempts to redefine religious liberty is to use it in a way that, that undercuts Roe. Um, say, uh, you know, these crisis pregnancy centers are kind of a good example that were up before the Supreme Court. They're using um, this sort of unassailable, I get to act out on my religion no matter what, uh, to set up these, these biz businesses that essentially lie to women. Um, and that's, that is certainly one way to chip it row. You might be better a place to answer um, this. Yeah, I mean, crisis pre pregnancy centers are a great example. Um, they are, you know, anti-choice uh, organizations whose goal is to um, convince pregnant women uh, to have babies rather than to um, obtain abortions. And they do hold themselves out as medical clinics and, and give medically inaccurate information, um, including about contraception. And I think one of the, I, I'm not so sure if, if religious justifications for the overturning of Roe versus Wade is the is anti-choice activists' best path. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I do think that in the wake of um, Roe versus Wade being overturned, which I think we all recognize is is probably on the horizon, um, things that are going to become so much more important to um, uh, mitigating the terrible effects of of that shift which is access to contraception, access to medically accurate um, sex education, access to um, long-acting contraception or uh, sterilization, and education about those things. Uh, those, are the, those are the things that are very susceptible to this um, world of, yeah. of, of so, so activism where, where religious actors the people who are the gatekeepers of this information of of contraception um, employers who uh, provide insurance plans and and you know are, are women's gateway to um, medical treatment and reproductive care um, and then of course pharmacists and you know doctors and saying. all the people who are Catholic hospitals right exactly um, all of the institutions and people who are, you know, at every point in the system supposed to be delivering um, reproductive health services to women, um, I think that's where there's a lot of potential for this type of, of, of idea, you know, that individuals have a religious right, you know, not to provide fill a services. prescription or yeah. provide... Um, so you're, you're kind of saying that the real danger to Roe is not probably from religious freedom, but in the wake of the damage that's going to be done to Roe. Is, right. For instance, if Kavanaugh get on, gets on the court, religious freedom is going to play a major role in that. Then there, then everybody, every pharmacist, every Catholic hospital is going to be saying, oh, yeah, we have a religious liberty right, and sorry. Yeah, so another, right. another way to say it would be, you know, Roe is maybe not likely to be actually overturned per se, but it's going to be gutted horribly and all of these... Uh, periphery fights are going to be uh, are, are going to come through take that center uh, stage. yeah take center stage and just make it row totally ineffective and will the religious liberty tax for task force be involved in those fights I'm I, I think it's a very yeah, good chance I could certainly see that right right um, oh here we go we're getting a couple other questions coming in here um, Linda Martin could this task force reinstate religious exemptions that allow parents to escape prosecution when they fail to provide medical care for religious reasons um, this she gives the example of faith healing sure. exemptions like those in Ohio, in uh, Idaho um, I wish reinstate were where we were at uh, these yeah. types of religious exemptions are on the books um, in Idaho as well as other states yeah so for, pe think? for people who don't know there there are exemptions to manslaughter murder child abuse um, assault laws that allow parents to 
for instance, prey over their children instead of taking them to see a doctor when they have something like diabetes. Um, and kids die from this all the time. Uh, and there are a number of states, Idaho included, Mississippi's one. Um, I think there are eight or nine states right now that have exemptions for murder uh, for uh, people who pray instead of take their kids to the doctor. And Ryan actually has done quite a bit of work on this. That was your capstone project was, in yeah. law school. But, I mean, it, it they were, the rationale for them is this is these people's religion. We can't force them to violate their religious beliefs by forcing them to seek medical care for a kid. So, I mean, religious liberty is certainly a an aspect of that fight. And I mean, the scarier version is not whether reinstate, but yeah, I mean, they could they could certainly use that to expand it. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that the religious liberty task force, the way it's being described, would would be on the side of the parents seeking to escape yeah. prosecution in a case like that. Um, and r right now, those exemptions are statutory. So for instance, they're written into the, the child law. abuse or the murder. But the Religious Liberty Task Force presumably would say that that's actually a First Amendment right. That's a constitutional right that would then cut across all state laws. And you wouldn't actually have to have it passed in every single state. Yeah, and it's been a slow grind to try to get states to remove these exemptions, whereas there's, there's other states that have never had the exemptions, or at least in modern history haven't had these exemptions. And if they were to win that battle and say, you have a First Amendment right to neglect your child if it's for religious reason, Th that would apply across the entire country immediately. Mm -hmm. Right. Just another example that should horrify us all of, you know, the logical kind of, to use a cliche, like slippery slope of just accepting generally the idea that your religion gives you the right to act in violation of the law. Like, you know, the law is a lot of things. It's it's laws against child abuse. It's not laws against negligent um, homicide. It's not just laws against discrimination in private businesses. Um, and it's really hard or impossible to draw lines about which laws, you know, we think that principle uh, applies to and which laws we don't. I mean, I think the obvious implication is there is no limit. Um, and, and it's especially impossible to draw those lines when you're taught religious freedom is codified in the First Amendment and the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Right. The whole idea is that there are no limits on this um, sort of free exercise right to act in violation mm -hmm. of laws. Um, it's, you know, it's a get out of jail free card. Yeah, and that's why the Smith decision was decided correctly that the if, if the government says we have this harm that we must prevent. So here is a totally neutral law that will prevent that harm. That law applies to everybody. You don't get to just say, oh, well, that law shouldn't apply to me because I and have a conflicting belief. And that's the opinion that Scalia wrote. And I always feel so dirty agreeing with Scalia right. on that opinion, but he was right. When you're right, or you're he right. he was correct. Yeah. Um, sometimes, <laughs> or, or that is kind of um, in part Colin's question here, Colin McMara, our Colin is downstairs Our one colleague. floor. For <laughs> uh, <laughs> Watching TV, apparently. <laughs> which is, yeah. Can you reconcile the Supreme Court's decisions in, in Smith and Yoder with um, what's going on Colin, now? So Nobody cares about that. Yeah, yeah <laughs> Mr. Technical <laughs> Lawyer, uh, not interesting guy. Uh, Ryan, you were kind of just alluding to this, so that's the only reason I'm reading Colin's question, which is, <laughs> is, is that case, Smith, where you said, hey, the Supreme Court has ruled on this. Um, you know, Scalia himself wrote that general um, neutral uh, laws apply to everyone and there's no free exercise right to violate those laws. Is that still good law in the wake of Masterpiece and in the in the time of the Religious Liberty Task Force? Are, uh, are, we, are we able to reconcile um, that sort of state of the law with what we're seeing now? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it is still good law and it's uh, the, the biggest threat to it from a practical perspective is the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA. Uh, which was a direct response to that ruling where, uh, you know, the cynical side of me would say, you know, in Smith, the defendants weren't evangelical Christians, so yeah. <laughs> maybe that had something to do with them saying, no, you don't get an exemption to the drug law. Um, but the response from... I don't that I would call that cynical either. It's okay. It's kind of accurate. Just, yeah, yeah, just, <laughs> just reality, fair. yeah. Fair. <laughs> um, but so the, rea the reaction from Congress was to say, hey, wait a minute, we, we Christians need exemptions to laws that conflict with our beliefs. So they passed RIFRA, and it's been uh, applied to largely un undermine Smith. But that's just a law that could be 
uh, repealed, repealed more more easily. Yeah. Um, and a law itself that we should point out is likely unconstitutional if right. you've got a fair hearing on it. And FFRF has argued that, including in the Hobby Lobby case. Yeah, but courts have never addressed that question right. head on. And that's a whole nother yeah. episode. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let me ask uh, one more question from Cole Tuninga. Historically, uh, is there a precedent by the courts in defining what constitutes a sincerely held religious belief? Seems like that would be a difficult thing to codify. Yeah. What about? Um, yeah, so this is part of the test that the court uses to look at religious liberty issues from time to time uh, without getting too into the legal weeds. Um, they kind of require that if you're making a challenge based on your religion that you have a sincerely held religious belief. Right. And. <laughs> Basically, for the most part, courts just defer to the person who is saying, making that argument, unless they are a prisoner, in which case the court <laughs> usually says none of what you believe is sincere. Yeah. Uh, that seems to be the case. And this was part of the, um, the religious liberty memo that Sessions wrote that the task force is supposed to be upholding, is that uh, the DOJ is not going to challenge people who raise this sincerely held belief uh, argument. So yeah. he's pretty much just saying out in the open, we are going to concede that point. If you say, I have a sincerely held religious belief that ABC, they're just going to tell the court to allow that. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's a bad policy, really. I mean, you know, in the Hobby Lobby case, they argued against a couple different kinds of contraception that they themselves had been providing a few months earlier through their health care right. plan. So it's like you obviously don't have a sincerely held religious belief because you were providing this exact same coverage to your employees for how 20 years before you all of a sudden found this particular belief that you're now taking to the Supreme Court. Right. So much of this is culture wars and mm -hmm. it's, you know, political and um, yeah, that's a, it's supposed to be this very objective deferential kind of thing, but it ends up being very subjective because um, especially evaluating um, religions and things that, you know, occupy the place of religion or um, satirical religions or, mm. or things like that. I mean, it's just, um, yeah, it's not workable. Um, and Correct. of course, like so many things, it's um, just open for manipulation, which kind of leads to this question, even though I said this was the last question, <laughs> we got another one. And I think um, it's alarmist, but I think it's a decent conversation point. So this is um, from, let's see, Pedro Grijalva saying, um, how can we win any case now at SCOTUS? It seems like they cherry pick to justify anything, such as the Masterpiece Cake Shop or the Muslim ban, um, even the Flower Shop case, which mm -hmm. is a similar to the Cake Shop case. The religious right keeps moving the goalposts. Um, <laughs> we atheists aren't even in the same city that the game is being played in. Um, it, thanks for everything you do. We'll keep fighting. How, how can yeah. we win um, when the courts uh, the makeup of the courts is undeniably shifting the political environment um you know that's probably the that's probably the biggest i think um legacy or will be the biggest legacy of this political moment that we're in right now is um the 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 remaking of the federal judiciary um, which will have a lasting impact not just scotus uh, but all the federal courts yeah. Yeah. um Silver lining, anyone? Yeah, I mean, well, in terms of the strategy, I think we, we keep fighting. We keep making good arguments. Uh, there's some hope that you can take in the demographics shift, that the country as a whole is becoming less and less Christian. So this block of evangelical Christianity that has a grip on the, uh, the, the government in large part uh, <laughs> and therefore is, you know, getting a larger... Uh, representation on the court is fading. So this is, it's, it's a long lasting severe problem, but it is a temporary problem. So, it, and of course, the other thing is that the, the judges are smart people. And so they will listen to reason in certain circumstances. So I, I continue to be hopeful that if we are making the, the right arguments, we can convince judges who at some level <laughs> we hope have to care about the constitution sure. and so at some point the other side's arguments are going to just be beyond the pale and the justices are going to say you've gone too far so that, that's one side of it in terms of the uh the federal supreme court another approach is uh that of course there are we have federalism and so it's always been a uh, 
kind of conservative states talking rights. point, yeah, saying states' rights and everything, but uh, that may be flipping in a way that we might get the right. uh, the Supreme Court of California deciding uh, based on the California Constitution and California law to pr make protections that the federal uh, courts are not willing to do. And that's one thing that FFRF has done, and we just recently won a case at the New Jersey Supreme Court, seven to zero on a, a state church issue that we took just under the New Jersey Constitution. Right. And I know people, it is, it can be disheartening in this day and age, but since January 1st, 2016, FFRF is 16 and one in our court cases. So we, we are winning this fight. It may not seem like it if you're just reading the news, but we are winning. Uh, that said, we're still getting 5,000 state church complaints every single year. So we don't need a religious liberty task force. We need a state church separation task force. We're not going to get that with Jeff Sessions and the DOJ, especially the way ADF has captured them. But until then, FFRF is certainly going to be here fighting for state church separation and for secularism. And probably even if the DOJ ever did institute that, we'd still be here fighting for it. That's what we do. So we're here for you, and don't worry about it. We're going to keep on fighting. Yeah, well, I think that's a good place to leave it for today. So um, thank you for joining us. And that is all for Ask an Atheist today. And just a reminder, again, FFRF's 2018 National Convention is coming up in San Francisco on November 2nd through the 4th. Speakers include author Salman Rushdie, the former director of Planned Parenthood, Cecile Richards, Mythbusters host Adam Savage, the actor John Delancey, ex-Muslims of North America co-founder Sarah Hader, um, the activist Ensef Hader, no relation, actress Julia Sweeney, and comedian Leanne Lord. Um, it's an awesome lineup. We are super pumped about it. You can register today at ffrf.org slash outreach slash convention. And as always, if you would like to receive text alerts on important issues in your area, text FFRF to 52886. Data rates may apply. Thank you for joining us today, and we will see you next week for another episode of FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I ain't afraid of no gays. If a guy seems odd, and he's got the wrong